I'm Felina Jean, and this is Black Broads Abroad. I'm an international woman of leisure who said peace out to the United States in 2011, and I have not looked back except at this ass, honey. Since then, I've lived on four continents with travel to over 40 countries. Along my journey, I've come to know some very compelling black women from all over the world who also said fuck you to their comfort zones. I created this podcast to inspire black women in the diaspora to take risks and live their very best lives. This week was cool. I'm still contending with my immigrant status and looking to be upgraded to being an expat again. But other than that, you know, things are moving pretty slowly, more slowly than I prefer. Living in Africa definitely um, teaches you patience and it requires patience. Although South Africa is like, it's quite progressive and a lot easier a place to assimilate to than most other African nations. I mean, there are nuisances here just like there are anywhere else. But the barrier to entry to get into the bag is far less competitive Hence my reason for being here, to secure all of the bags, all of them at once. (laughs) Definitely way more pros than cons, though. I mean, one um, dollar is like 14 rand, so your money is just multiplying like 14 times. So, yeah, we like that. So anyway, this week, um, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I started fielding questions from the community of Black Broads Abroad, and I'm going to introduce a new um, Q&A segment from time to time. So we have a question from at the Brittany Empire, who is from Atlanta, but currently staying in Cape Town for three months. And she wants to know about property purchasing restrictions for foreigners. Let me first just give um, a disclaimer. This is only my advice. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an advisor or a real estate agent of any kind. But um, in short, with my dealings, there are no restrictions. Um, I cashed out on a place here a few years ago and I couldn't get a cardboard box on Skid Row for what I paid for this flat. And obviously I'm being hyperbolic, but Something to consider is because your money multiplies 14 times, you can really get some really decent and like really tricked out pads for less than a quarter of what you're paying in major cities in the United States. And some in some instances, probably like 10 or 20 percent of what you would pay in, um, in major cities in the United States. I have heard that there are um, 50% bonds for foreigners. Um, So in effect, you could get a mortgage uh, if you're inclined to. I have not gone that route, but apparently that is a rule here. And the second question was about culture shock and how it rears its ugly head. You know, honestly, um, that's an interesting question because I've, I basically feel foreign everywhere. I feel foreign in America. So coming back home, I feel like um, I'm experiencing culture shock. So here, living in South Africa, I really haven't experienced culture shock to a great extent because it it is it is very um, progressive. Um, Johannesburg feels very much like New York. Cape Town feels like. LA and I I believe Cape Town is like the same distance from the equator as LA so the weather patterns are the same I mean we have similar histories with the apartheid movement and the civil rights movement being relatively contemporary movements in um, both African American and South African history so yeah culture shock I haven't really I haven't really felt any I hope that answers your question. Thank you at the Brittany Empire. Uh, You'll be in South Africa for three months. So that's ample time to get a lot of stuff popping and in motion. Good luck. So stick around for our interview. I'm kind of excited about this one because Nikki Faye is a really dope black broad abroad who was once an entertainment attorney and 
just chunk the deuces to her Hollywood career and began traveling the world. She's currently based in Nairobi, but she had a stop in South Africa and Turkey before that and many countries in between. So stick around for that interview. She has some really good tips on traveling the world on a budget, maintaining um, several streams of income while you travel. Tons of tidbits. Stick around for that. But first. Let me tell y'all motherfuckers what happened last week. In cooning and buffooning news, the internets are dragging both Gail King and Oprah Winfrey once again for their perceived vile attacks on black men's character. So as you know, Oprah recently stepped down from doing a documentary on Russell Simmons' alleged sexual improprieties with women. And most recently, Gail King had the opportunity to interview Lisa Leslie on CBS, and she was prodding her for details about the deceased Kobe Bryant's behavior. Bringing up a dismissed sexual assault charge, it really seemed like to me that Gail was trying to gold um, Lisa Leslie into dragging Kobe into some kind of posthumous Me Too meme. Personally, I have questions. Why didn't she go after her own colleague, Charlie Rose, with that same kind of energy? I mean, Les Moonves had to step down for CBS for fucking off with women like almost the entirety of his career and she ain't come for him not once. Well, singer Ari Lennox has a message for both Oprah and Gayle King. If I had never seen a coon more fucking coonier than goddamn Kale, I mean, Kale and, and, and Okra. I'm over y'all. I'm over y'all. I don't give a fuck how rich you are, how much you fucking accomplish. You're tearing down the legacies of so many phenomenal, beautiful black men, and I don't fucking have time for it. I don't fucking have time for it. And that's that on that. Her words, not mine. I still want a job from Oprah. Ousted ex-South African president Jacob Zuma has been issued an arrest warrant. The former president and French arms company Thales faced charges related to a multi-billion dollar RAND arms deal. Zuma allegedly received 783 illegal payments from Thales through his formal financial advisor. The high court has dismissed Zuma's attempts to have the charges dropped. The warrant will be affected if Zuma fails to appear in court on May 6th. Jacob's whereabouts are unknown. He's reportedly receiving medical treatment in a foreign jurisdiction. Some speculate maybe Cuba. Looky here, looky here. A president all the way on the continent of Africa being held accountable for his crimes. And a cracker is a cracker is a goddamn cracker news. Your president awarded Rush fucking Limbaugh the Presidential Medal of Freedom during his State of the Union address. It is not lost upon me that this happened during Black History Month while he was seated next to a Tuskegee Airman. The absolute fuck shit of it all. Rush Limbaugh is the king of mega horn racism. Fuck a dog whistle. He made songs about Barack the Magic Negro. He said the NFL looks like a fight between the Crips and the Bloods. And probably most absurd of them all is he's quoted in saying, it's preposterous that Caucasians are blamed for slavery when they've done more to end it than any other race. His ass must be jealous of the shit that comes out his mouth. The highlight, of course, of the State of the Union came from my second favorite Congresswoman after Maxine Waters, of course, who's also from California, Nancy motherfucking Pelosi. Last year, she gave your president the absolute business with that patronizing attaboy hand clap at the end of his speech. This year, she tore the whole constitution in half at the end of his address like an old rich sugar daddy just handed her a prenup. I am here for this high level political pettiness. Thank you, Alabasta Auntie Nancy. I fuck with you the long way. And that's it for... Let me tell y'all motherfuckers what happened last week. Until next time. Nikki Faye started her career working in music with some of the top urban artists, including Beyonce. 
From there, she went on to law school and earned her JD and MBA. Soon after, she began her career in entertainment law and for six years worked for some of the top entertainment companies in the world, where she brokered licensing deals for major television networks. Feeling a calling for something greater, Nikki Faye moved to Columbia for a year before she started traveling full time. She now is the owner of Whatever Whenever Concierge Service, a bespoke and personalized service that works with world-class busy professionals to meet their everyday lifestyle needs while they're traveling. She also has a robust social media following and blog entitled Nikki Fay the Wanderer that catalogs her experiences as a world traveler. Welcome, Nikki Fay. Thank you. <laughs> interview was like kind of last minute. I'm just going to give like a quick background on like how I came to kind of know you because we haven't met in person, but we have this right. secret um, expat women's group. And last week I had to quickly facilitate a visa run and girl, you came through and <laughs> like you helped me get over the border. And then when I first um, got back to South Africa, um, Maxine Waters was here and I was like oh my god I want to see her like we attend the same church in Watts and so I was like I gotta go and you hooked me up with some tickets so thank you I'm so happy to be interviewing you today you're very welcome I'm happy it all worked out for you so you have such an interesting experience um, as an expat how long have you been on your expat journey and what countries have you resided in I've been an expat for about three years. Um, I like to say four because I was, I started out, um, I did a year before I actually formally left. Mm -hmm. um, so about four years. And um, I started out in Colombia. And um, I said in Colombia for about a year too long. And once I was there, I was like, you know what, I don't think I left my country to be somewhere forever. I really want to travel. So I decided to spend three to six months in each country before moving on to the next country. So, so far I've lived in, um, outside of Colombia, I've lived in Johannesburg, London, uh, Turkey, and now uh, Kenya. That's amazing. So you are currently residing in, in Nairobi after leaving Johannesburg. And people often view Africa as a monolith without knowing there's over 2,000 languages spoken on the continent and thousands of diverse cultures and tribes. What do you love most about living and traveling in Africa? And what are some of the key differences between living in Josie versus Nairobi? Uh, for me, it's, it's been really important to explore, to learn the history of what's happened on this continent. The continent is just so rich with information, things that we've never heard of. I mean, for me, when I had heard of Africa, I thought of immediately the commercials I would see with the little kids. They're hungry. They have the flies all around their nose and the big stomachs. And that's kind of what I related to Africa. So when I first started visiting and started learning more, I was like, okay, I need to know more. Like what's happened like in every single country. So it, it is my goal to, to visit every single country. And I think it's easier because I'm on the continent now, but I'm living here now. But um, I've learned so much. And I think it's important for us, you know, Black Americans to really dig deeply into that culture, because I think it's important to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. And also some of the missteps that have happened along the way. Um, I, I came to, well, actually, I was in Kenya first. Then I went to Joburg um, only because... Um, I still wanted to be on the continent, but I felt like Kenya was too expensive and I felt like Johannesburg was cheaper. Um, so, but when I got there, I just couldn't really wrap my mind around the feeling of always being on edge and, you know, something might happen. So that kind of, and yeah, and Joburg kind of drew me back to Kenya. But for me, it's like, Joburg, I love because it's so modern, so it's kind of, you know, it's very westernized, so it reminds me a lot of home. And a lot of the things that I'm familiar with, I can access um, there. Um, whereas here, it's a little bit more rural, and they don't have access to a lot of the modern um, amenities that are available in Johannesburg. So that's, those are kind of the differences. But I think, you know, both places are rich in culture, but I think for me, I was just stuck kind of in the city. I'm like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I was, you know, kind of just staying like, you know, in the major areas as opposed to venturing out more is, 
like when I had visited there just on vacation. So I think sometimes I just get stuck, you know, in a place. So I, I didn't really go outside of the norms in Joburg. So I can't really say I had a full living experience. I just kind of stayed in, um, I forgot the area I was staying in. It was, uh, were you in the North in Santon or CBD? Not Santon. What's the, uh, Melrose Arch, that area? What is that? Santon. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Santon. I like the North. It's real bougie. It's the, um, wealthiest square mile in Africa. Um, you did mention like Joburg being like super Western for me transitioning here. It really, it really wasn't a big leap. Johannesburg feels like New York, New York city to me. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's uncanny. So one of the things that we share in common is that we're both black female solo travelers. It's my preferred um, way to travel, but the people, the ubiquitous they would warn against this. Can you dispel any myths about traveling by yourself as a woman? I mean, for me, it's just like, so I look at it as when I was, when I lived in LA, I was by myself too. You know, it's a major city. <laughs> Crime indeed happens there as in anywhere else. So it's like being anywhere. I mean, if you come here to Kenya, this is someone's city. If you go to Joburg, that's someone's city. And people are doing their daily lives alone. Most people aren't attached, you know, at the hip to someone else. You know, even if you're married, you have separate, you, you have to go to your job, you have to run errands, you're doing those things alone. And there are women doing these things alone in every single country. Um, yes, dangers lurk in any country, you know, at any given time, but you just, you're, you're careful, you know, you protect yourself and um, you don't make yourself a target, you know, by wearing a bunch of jewelry and, you know, showing how much you're balling out, you know, kind of thing. But I don't, I don't find it a problem. I've really never had a problem um, being a solo traveler. There's only one country I went to and had an actual problem. So, and that's out of the over 50 countries I've been to. So that's one problem in all those countries. So I, I think it's fair to say it's safe. What country did you encounter a problem as a solo traveler? Turkey. Really? I have turkey questions, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll get to that. But you also <laughs> have a free ebook. Um, you have a free ebook on your website entitled How I Traveled the World Solo with $2 in the bank. Girl, how is that even possible? Give us the tea. You know what's funny is that no one actually believes me. I think when people read it, they think it's just like a a sales tool or like a marketing tool I'm using to draw them in. But I'm like, no, real talk, you could travel with zero dollars. Like I just did another free ebook because I'm like, they weren't really getting it. So I'm, I'm, I'm well, not if they're free, but, but I'm doing a mu another in-depth um, ebook about specifically um, how you travel for free, like with actual itineraries. Like this is where you go, this is what you do to travel completely for free. Like you, you can travel with zero, zero dollars. Like if you're so brave, you can either even hitchhike on a plane to get to your destination or you can hitchhike on a boat. Wait, Paul, you said hitchhike on a plane. How do you hitchhike on a plane? Yes, yes, you can hitchhike. So as you know, and you don't think about this, but as you know, there are several private planes that take off every day going all different parts of the world. Hmm. All you have to do is go down to that airfield and basically it's just like hitchhiking on the street. You pitch a sign and say, Hey, I'm going here. Can I hitch a ride? And someone may say, Oh, I'm not going there, but I'm going here. And what? then from that place, you can hitch another ride. Are you serious? I've never heard Seriously. of it. That's uh man, that's high level T right there. <laughs> yeah. Or you can go catch a boat, you know, and say, hey, you know, let me hitchhike on this boat. They're cargo ships that go every day. They have space, you know. And if they're, you know, if you're so inclined to ask them to let you hitch a ride, they'll do it. Like, why not? You know, there's so many ways to travel for free. So I break it down like, you know, each each way, well, not every way, but I break down at least eight ways in this new book. But I'm just like, this is really true, people. I'm not making this up. <laughs> this is really happening in my life. That's crazy. So you've actually hitched a ride on a plane? Okay, I haven't hitched a ride on a plane because <laughs> like, I'm not in dire straits that I don't you know, have the money to buy a flight. It's just I enjoy not spending a whole lot of money when I travel. So what I will spend money on is a flight, <laughs> but I also will take a bus. So I haven't personally hitched, but I do know people who have hitched rides on planes. And I actually hitched one ride on a plane. I'll take that back. I'd hitched one ride on a plane, 
but that was it. <laughs> oh, wow. So you also share um, a wealth of information on your website, NikkiFayTheWonder.com, about how to make money while you're living abroad. And you have an entire section devoted to those who want to invest abroad. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. more about some of the top countries to invest in in order to generate residual income to fund your travel? Well, I can't give you a comprehensive list. I, I can only give you my experience. But when I started traveling, I went to Colombia, and, and, and from that point, I was just living there and I just noticed opportunities to make money. And one of those was investing in property. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I discovered, because I'm like, you know, when I'm looking for my Airbnbs, I was like, I am spending hours a day looking for the perfect Airbnb for me, you know? And what I was um, lacking, I actually put into the market myself because I wanted something modern, something very American, you know what we like. Yeah. And so that wasn't readily available. And when it was, it was always completely booked. So I was like, oh, that's a good business model. <laughs> How about create, you know, secure some property and, and create Airbnbs. Um, that are attracted to people like me. And that's what I did. Yeah, that's so what, that's something I've done in every country. And that's how I started the concierge business too. I'm like, oh, there's a need, you know, because there are dangers that still lurk in, you know, in Colombia, um, a residual of the, you know, Pablo Escobar effect. But, you know, so I, I just really wanted to protect people. I'm like, you know, tourists really need some help. And plus, you know, the gringo prices are really real. So it's like, you know, you come to any given country, and they're giving you, you know, a hundred times the price just because they think you're rich. So I created an avenue for that too. So it's just like every place I've been, literally, I've figured out what's, what's the need here or what are things that people may want when they come here on vacation. And I've tried to fill that need. So that, you can do that in any, any part of the world. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was talking to my homegirl the other day because I had a whole uh, green guy experience. Like people will hear your American accent and she was like, you know what? Being an American will take you far and get you got at the same damn time. And it's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be like, mm -hmm. learn to uh, learn expert bartering skills out here in these streets. It's true. It's true. And when you're coming into a city, you don't really, so, like if you're coming for a vacation, you don't so much have the time to do that. You have four or five days. You don't want to spend your entire trip haggling. So that's why I created that company, because I'm like, you know, who wants to do that? Let me just give you the best prices, and you pay me for the service. So, you know, now you know exactly what you're supposed to be spending, and then what you're even spending on me. Like, I'm giving you the exact rates, but then I charge you a fee. So you know what that is. Either you accept it or, you know, you, you move on to something else. Oh, wow. So, I mean, one of the things we were just talking about, you have this concierge company, and what was the impetus behind um, creating whatever, whatever, concierge services? I'm just being honest. Actually, no one has ever asked me that. Really? <laughs> not, not publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so, it really started in Colombia because, um, as you know, a lot of guys come there for you know, whatever reasons they come. And I just wanted to help them be safe because it's no sense. You want to come there and have a good time. You don't want to die over it, you know, you whatever the reason is that you've showed up. Hmm? Are you talking about sexual tourism? The guy is going to yeah. come? Okay. Yeah, pretty much, pretty mm -hmm. much. But, you know, people were showing up like one night, you know, meeting some strange woman on the street. And the next morning, you know, they're dead inside of their suitcase in front of the hotel. So it's just like, that, that's just crazy. Like, and a group of my friends were coming. And I was like, you know, I know what you've come, you, you've come here for. And I, let me just help you do it safely. So yeah. I just put together these business and I planned the tours and I, uh, even car services. Because there was, you know, a guy who, um, an American actually, who was killed in a taxi. So basically the taxi picked him up and they had a guy jump in after he jumped in and they robbed him and killed him. So it's just like, I just wanted to keep that kind of thing from happening to my friends. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me connect you with drivers and um, services and um, accommodations that I know are safe, just so you're protected. And that's how that business started. Okay. So on the subject of sexual tourism, unfortunately, like due to very popular iconography in the media, Black women are often perceived as hypersexual globally, but I found that like having Michelle Obama as our first lady has dispelled 
some of the myths about this. Have you ever been mistaken for a prostitute? Because this has happened to me on a, a few occasions. Have you ever encountered this? Only in Turkey. Only in Turkey. Let's get mm -hmm. to the turkey tea, honey. Because <laughs> turkey used to be my honeycomb hideout when I lived in Qatar because it was cheap. Um, the ticket was really cheap. It was a four-hour plane ride. And I don't think people really know what that country is hidden for. So what were some of your favorite things to do there? And what were some of the um, stranger things you encountered? Um... I can't say I have a, you know, I, I just, I really don't promote Turkish tourism, really. I mean, you know, it's, it's cheap to travel and um, it's a beautiful country, but the way I was treated and, you know, the situations I encounter were really so bad for me that I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. So, I mean, what yeah, I, I, can you share? Um, you know, people get upset when I, I, I mention this, but I, I, it's a beautiful place and it's really inexpensive. And I would have spent, you know, far more time there if these things weren't happening. But it's every day someone was trying to pick me up as a prostitute. And um, it can be very uncomfortable for a person, a woman traveling alone, you know. And uh, I mean, people, guys would literally back down the street, like, you know, a one way street, come down reverse the other way to try to pick me up and you know I don't know what they were saying because I don't speak Turkish but I'm I'm assuming it was something inappropriate and then the for me it was just the racism was just too much you know it was just too much you know like every day you know I was encountered with some sort of racism um wow. with for men and women and you know I have friends there really great friends there you know, some of them, you know, their children are in school and the, the racism they were encountering, like one of the schools had a, and it was actually an international school, by the way, they had an Africa day. And I'm like, you know, the thought of an Africa day makes sense, right? It's like, oh, that's really nice. But their idea of Africa day was painting their kids blackface and having them only eat rice all day, saying this is what it's like to be an African. Oh my yeah. God. See, this is actually one of the key differences between like living in a place and like traveling to a place is like a polar yeah. experience. And so I've been to Turkey several times. I never encountered that. But like you said, it's, it's much different. Like it's much different living. Um, yeah, every country for me is different living there because I don't visit places for four and five days. I stay for months at a time. So because I like to know what the country really is about and dig really, you know, dig much deeper than a surface level um, vacation. So as I've explored these countries, I, you know, I've been, I've been able to encounter these things and, re and tell a real story about this country. And, you know, and, and looking at the school system, if they're taught racism at a, a young age, like it's, it's no wonder they're racist. You know, it's no wonder you go into a restaurant and there's a black mammy painted all across the entire wall. You know, it's no wonder you go into a restaurant and you're treated like a second class citizen because in their minds, that's what you are. So it's like, and literally my, so there, there are four of us who, who were in town at the same time for a longer period, long-term visit. And out of, I'm sorry, five of us. Out of the five of us, four of us were assaulted. What? Like, yeah, when I say assaulted, I don't mean like acute, like we got pushed. We were all punched in the face by Turkish men, all of us. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry you had to contend with that. That's crazy. Yeah, so punched in the face, spit in the face, and all these things. These are these are the things that happened to us. And one time, my friend, she got assaulted by a woman in a, a restaurant, and she told the owner, "Excuse me, this lady assaulted me." And he said, "We're not racist. We're not racist." And she wasn't saying no one, anyone was racist. She was just saying this lady hit me. <laughs> you know, you should do something because it's your restaurant. So it's like that kind of treatment. I I can't sign up for, and I can't like you know really in good conscience tell someone else to visit. So even the pictures I posted. You know, I posted them because they were pretty pictures, but I didn't say anything about the country because I'm like, I just can't promote it after the experience that I had when I was there. Not saying that there aren't some good people because I did meet some Turkish people who were good people. Um, all the men, I can't leave one man out. All the men were very uh, sexually charged though. And, you know, trying to, I guess thinking we're prostitutes or women, black women are loose and trying to get sex. Even the guys who were really nice people were still trying to get sex, you know? So, you know, that, that experience doesn't make things, you know, very a happy place for me, you know? Yeah, I guess it wouldn't. I'm really sorry you experienced that. 
But you've also been very open about some aspects of your personal life as a traveler, which is one of the reasons that your audience tunes into your quite riveting IG stories. <laughs> and one of the many questions that women ask is, what is dating like as a traveler in other countries? Can you share any interesting stories about um, what the courtship has been like for you living abroad? Well, I can tell you what it's like dating as a black woman mm -hmm. because it's, it's obviously different for us. Um, but I feel like when I'm traveling abroad, I feel very much appreciated. You know, sometimes I don't feel that way at home, you know, appreciated by, you know, men who we encounter there. But I feel like, you know, I, I feel very loved, you know, when traveling the world. And um, it's actually been a really good experience for me. Not that I haven't had bad experiences with anything. There's good and bad. But I've had some, you know, really phenomenal experiences. And I felt, I, I feel like, you know, in the States, I... And it was like, okay, you know, I might be cute, you know, but when I traveled abroad, I'm like, oh my God, I must be like the most beautiful girl in the world, you know, <laughs> so, but it's like the attention, you know, and positive attention, not just like the, not the Turkish experience, but like, you know, positive attention, like you're beautiful and, you know, can I take you out, you know, these things and can I take care of you and can I marry you? And it's like, oh, wow, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> so it's really nice to get that kind of attention, you know, that the rest of the women in the world experience. So I'm like, man, I guess it is nice being a woman when you're getting this all the time. So for me, dating has been really phenomenal. Oh, that's good. That's really good. So, I mean, this podcast is definitely about encouraging Black women to, you know, step outside of their comfort zones. What is the biggest lesson that you've learned about stepping out of yours? <laughs> well, I mean, I think for me, and I think a lot of us, maybe a lot of women generally, I don't know, I can only speak for myself, but, um, but we have these preconceived notions of what we should be looking for. You know, he has to be over six feet. He has to be chocolate or, you know, whatever your criteria is. He has to have, you know, he has to be a, uh, a corporate executive or, you know, whatever those things are. But what I've really discovered abroad, which for me is outside of my comfort zone, is really like, um, just looking for people who are good hearted, you know, like a good hearted person and dating out. Cause before, honestly, like I was never into African men, you know, just a personal purpose, nothing wrong with African people, but I was never into African men. Then I came here and I'm like, Oh, well, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> really African has nothing to do with the price of tea in China. It's really, you know, who's a kind hearted person who loves you and you know, who's treating you well. Cause I always tell women like, go where you're loved and appreciated. And if that's not in the States, go somewhere else because you deserve that kind of love. You deserve that kind of appreciation. And it feels so good. And why deprive yourself of that? <laughs> yeah, I think you had an um, IG story about um, dating a Kenyan man. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> that guy, it was phenomenal. It was, it was a great experience. He wined me and dined me and gave me everything I wanted. I never had to worry about anything. I could be in a country and I could, you know, tell him, hey, I, I'm ready to go. And he'd fly me out and wherever I wanted to go. So it was really nice. Like, I really felt, you know, I really felt like pampered, you know. I really felt like a, a doll and he was really just taking care of me. So it was actually really nice. <laughs> What, it, what advice would you offer to Black women who are thinking about um, taking the leap and becoming an expat? I think you should do it. I think it's, you know, it can be, um, it can be a little daunting because you're leaving a place of comfort and you're leaving a place where you see a lot of people who look like you. And that won't always be the case when you're traveling. But I think that is okay. I think it's, it's great to be able to learn about other cultures and other people and how they do things in other places and explore the world. The world is so big. And I think, you know, we do ourselves a great a great injustice by just sitting in one place for our entire lives. Like, yes, our family's there. Yes, our friends are there, you know, but I think it's important for you to explore. So even if you just take maybe a year and just explore the world and then go back, you know, it's, it's a really great experience. It's something that's provided me a level of freedom that I've never experienced ever in my life. So I highly recommend it. Um, so I was looking on your, um, on your Instagram feed and your, um, and your website, and you've had some really exciting travels over the past year. Where, where have you gone? Um, over the past year, wow. 
I know. That's a tough one because I it's so many places I forget. I was looking at my um, Google Maps sent me an email yesterday saying I went to 33 countries last year. I was like, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, what were some of the highlights if you if you can't expound on all 33? Um, the highlights. Well, I loved. I had a really enjoyable time in Bali. Um, I really met some amazing people in Botswana. Um, I really learned a, a lot about, you know, a lot of the countries, um, in the, in the, on the continent. Mm -hmm. And, um, let's see. I don't know. I, I, I really love every place. So it's not like, you know, any one place stands out for me because I love every country unless I hate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously. But I really had an enjoyable time, you know, traveling back across Europe again to a few countries. Um, I did fall in love with Greece. I think it's a beautiful country. I enjoyed myself. I know that I've heard some, you know, bad stories and horror stories, but um, it was a, that was a vacation for me. So I can't really speak in depth about Greece, but it was a beautiful vacation. Really? Bali, I stayed there oh. for a month and loved it. Were you in uh, Athens? I went to Athens, yes, and I also went to Ia and um, Santorini. Hmm. So it was very nice. Uh, it was a good experience, but it was a vacation, so I can't speak much to it, but it was a lovely vacation. Yeah, vacation and, um, is so much different than, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is, this is so, it's a much different experience than having like an immersive experience. Yeah, you know, I actually, after that vacation, I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna sort of change up the way I travel a little bit and um, start doing like, cause I already do like, you know, short trips, but I don't, it, I don't do as many short trips cause I'm like, no, I wanna stay there a long time. Um, so I think I'm going to start incorporating more short trips so I can, you know, experience more places. I'm more of a surface level because I think for some places it's required. I went to Russia this year and fell in love completely. How was Russia? Oh, I loved it. It, it. You know, it's one of those places that you've learned about your entire life, but nothing good, right? Right. So I expected it to be like a nightmare. I was afraid, you know, I was actually in Turkey at the time that I went. And I was afraid and I was like, I don't know how they're going to treat me. I'm black, you know, they don't have black people. But I received a far warmer reception in, in Russia than I did in Turkey. So I was very happy to be there. I was like, man, I should have spent my time in Russia. And it's very inexpensive to be there. So Russia was just amazing. It's one of the most beautiful countries I've ever traveled to. Um, if you have a chance to go to Moscow, Moscow, definitely go because it's Oh, so beautiful and so clean. Like literally, I said that in Tokyo, but in, in Moscow, you can really eat off the ground. It's so clean. Really? Oh, yes. Yes. So beautiful. I love it there. Love it. Like if I can go again a couple times this year, I absolutely will. It was that amazing. I've always wanted to go to like Russia to, to just cop a, cop a fur, a full length sable way down to the carpet. <laughs> I go to play, but uh, I might have to put that on my to-do list for 2020. But where the hell is in Joburg? I just, I really want a sable girl. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up next for Nikki Faye and where can people follow you on social media? Well, right now I'm about to release, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, an eight country itinerary of free travel, completely free travel because people aren't believing me. So I'm putting this out. So that'll be out um, next month. And you can find me on Instagram.com slash Nikki Faye the Wanderer. And that's spelled N-I-K-K-I-T-H-E-W-A-N-D-E-R-E-R. Oh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to continuing to follow your journey. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. They come up to me today saying that Elto came to her and said, it's Charlene feeling all right. I said, what? Feeling all right? She coming out. Charlene taking a break from her fashion. God came to me in a dream. He said, Shirley, slow down. Be ye not puffed up because you're so fashionable. So I said, okay. But now, I'm going to come to church. If they, if y'all want them to drag y'all out to church two or three at a time every Sunday because I didn't kill you with my fashions. 
So be it. You want grace now? Ask God for grace. When you come to somebody talking about Charlotte, put some respect on my name. You don't get best dressed every Sunday, best dressed every year, 11 years in a row wearing mediocre clothes. It's called being casual. It's called being casual. Anyone else have a word from the Lord, a testimony of God's goodness? Today's Sunday sermon is brought to you by Miss Shirley, who reminds us that when accidentally stunting is habitual, as the gender fluid rap apostle Young Jock reminds us in his song of the same name, we shall not cower to nobody to dim our shine. Know that who you are naturally bad and bossy and in your lane, securing bags and doing the fuck out of you, people are going to be mad. And it be your own family, your friends, people you put on, have broke bread with, that low-key ain't really happy for you. Yeah, they smile, they may show some tepid interest, but on some real shit, be seething on the inside. It be strangers that will fuck with you the long way and support your business and your endeavors. I went to a very intimate um, vision board gathering um, over the weekend that my dear friend um, Lakeidra hosted. And it was at a beautiful, reclusive farm with zebras and spring box and just beautiful gardens in a very natural habitat. It was a group of us women being vulnerable and talking about you know, our visions for going into 2020 and, and some of the shit, frankly, that we want to leave behind. And one of the ladies was very open in sharing how it's been a very difficult journey for her giving up a political career and moving to Africa without the support of her family. And I won't go too much into detail because it was a private conversation. But the point is, sometimes it's the people who are closest to you that are uncomfortable with you not being comfortable in your comfort zone. It can be painful, but shine and grow anyway. My big papa sent me a meme this week that perfectly encapsulates this sentiment. When you start a business, the people who will trust you first will be strangers. Friends will be shielding against you. Fair weather friends will be distant. Family will look down on you. The day you finally succeed, paying bills for every get together and dinner and entertainment, that's when you will realize everyone else is there except the strangers. But as Miss Charlene said in her riveting testimony, if you want grace, ask God for grace. It's some people that showed me they hold entire ass at entry level six figures. So notice, friend, family, foe, if you tow your ass with me over some nigga pennies, ain't no circling back on the come up. As Oprah said, that was your Negro exit fee, a tax write-off boo-boo. Accidentally stunting may be habitual in your life also. Though you may not have a Chevy with them butterfly doors as young jock raps, but you got a passport and a dream and some talent, whether it's writing or business expertise, you may be a teacher, you may be a yoga instructor, you may be a baddie that just wants to leverage her assets internationally. Whatever you are, just let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. God bless.